of my favorite robots in FRC history. My top 20 robots in FRC history. This, these weren't voted on. This is my opinions. This is the same exact presentation. Well, for the most part, I'm going to tell a story. But this is mostly the same as that presentation I gave last year and the year before. So if you sat into those, you're not really going to do, or you're not going to experience anything new. If you want to walk out and do something else, I'm not going to be insulted by that. <coughs> so I'm a mechanical engineer. I graduated from University of Evansville. When I when I got my degree, I got hired on at, at Delco Electronics in Kokomo, Indiana. I sat down at my desk, and the guy sitting next to me was the lead designer on this goofy robot competition that we're driving around on corn. So I've been in the right place at the right time to learn and see how FIRST has grown since 1992. So I've seen all the games. I know a lot of history about what has happened over those years. I've been a mentor since 1998. I was honored to win a championship Woody Flowers Award um, in 2003. In 2004, I co-founded Mark Andy Mark with Mark Coors. Um, and I also founded some other things. I've been a, a referee, a, um, vol volunteer inspector, lead robot inspector, head referee, but I don't do those things anymore. If I go to events as a volunteer, usually I'm either a judge or an inspector. I just kind of, I like doing those things. In this presentation, I want to highlight the designs that really changed FRC. Those are my favorite robots that some of, the, some of these robots might not have won the world championships, but they were a design that changed FRC in my mind. I want to give credit to the teams that come up. They came up with these designs, and um, the ones that are commonplace now, they had to be implemented in first at one point by 18. I want to recognize the best robots built in FRC and point out some dramatic design failures and successes. And one of my criteria is I, don't, I, I, I didn't let myself choose more than one robot from one team. For example, um, Symbotics 1114, they've created a lot of robots. A lot of them were very great. I picked one. I give this presentation in Indiana, so this is for the Indiana folks, but I'm not going to talk about that with you guys. So let's get started. There's a lot of content here. I'm going to whiz through some stuff. I'm going to be going through some slides, and I'll click on some hyperlinks to get to some YouTube channels. Hopefully that stuff will load up, and we'll see some videos of what happens. And they're not perfectly edited, so I'll have to fiddle with the timing of some of those channels, and um, some of them you might see some of the videos multiple times. That, hopefully that won't fall over. We'll see. Um, oh, this one here, I actually have to edit this slide because they weren't world champs. This, this they were runner up. I, and they were fun too, but. <laughs> okay, so in 2006, sorry for that. In 2006, um, that was the, th the fourth year of autonomous mode. And in 2006, it was the, the first year of the small basketball that you shot through a, a <coughs> hole in the wall. And, and the hole that year was a vertical hole. So if you line drive the shot through the hole, you just powered it through, that would, that would be the best way to shoot that ball. And this team, Raider Robotics out of New Jersey, has a wonderful program. And they had a robot that they defined six-wheel drive at, the, at that time almost better than anybody. They had all the same, all six wheels were on the same plane. They didn't have a drop center. They were all on the same plane. No one figured it, they could figure out how they could turn because they had a lot of scrub. So what Sean McNulty eventually said publicly, he said that they, they cut special grooves in the front and the back reels so that they could scrub. That year, if you won auto mode, you essentially won the match. So they would load up all these balls, you can see, in the top of the robot and um, be be before the match, and they would shoot them all in auto mode. And if they got them all in or got a lot of them in, they, they won most of those matches. Also, they had a world championship robot in 2000, and they had a very good robot in 2003 that I liked. Uh, cheesy Poofs have wonderful robots every year. Uh, they were the world champs in 2011, Logo Motion. And they had an excellent multi-stage telescoping lift systems. Hmm, kind of familiar for this year, right? 
So my guess is a lot of teams referred back to this robot when they were designing this year's robot on your team. They had a, they, that year they had a, I don't know if you guys heard about this, but they had a little mini bot that you deployed off your robot and it cl climbed up a pole and if it was the first to hit the top of the pole, you got a lot of extra points. People early on in the season thought that those mini bots were, um, would take like four or five seconds to get up the pole and somebody, not, not these guys, but another team made a mini bot to go up the pole in less than one second. But really, the, the thing about their design was their elegant and simple and really clean lift system. Let's see if this happens right. And they also make really nice um, reveal videos. So you can see that they're, they're grabbing a tube. This, this year, the, the tubes were squares. Oh. Okay, sorry. How do I share that? Uh, okay. I'm not used to this style of PowerPoint. Bear with me. All right, this should work. Oh, it was already going over here. Let's go back. You, so you can see that. Okay, th this year they had, oh. <laughs> hang on, hang on, hang on. We're not to 118 yet. Okay, so this year we, they had a square, a circle, and a triangle as tubes that they would grab. A lot of teams use roller claws, and you're going to see a roller claw in there. You're going to see this elegant lift system eventually. Hey. Maybe if I just, I just don't go full screen, we'll be, we'll be okay, I think. Obviously, very good drivetrain. So this, this lift system was a lot tighter and more elegant than many other lift systems at the time. I think, I would guess, did anybody d design their lift system depending on this speci specific robot in 2011? Anybody look at that? Because you, you could have, because this was a very nice system. Uh, hinged hinge gripper, roller claw, up and down really quickly, and this is seven years ago. They figured out a lot of this stuff before we figured it out, a lot of our teams did this year. That year, if you, if you got the logo, um, triangle, circle, square in the right order, you got more points, and also, I think the yellow, the yellow cube was a wild card, I think, or a cap, car, cap cube, I forget. Well, okay, right. All right, I got 20 more, or 19 more to go through. Let's stop on this, sorry. That took a lot of time. Okay. Team, uh, team, 2000, uh, team 60, Bionic Bulldogs, Kingman High School, had a wonderful robot in 2002. As you can see from the picture, powder coated, wedge top treads on the, on the wheels. No one else did that. They found conveyor belt treads and put them on the wheels before anybody found rough top or wedge top. That was a big deal with, with first back then. Everybody was using Skyway wheels or just like, maybe some pneumatic tires, but nobody was using wedge top treads. That was a first back then. Also, tell me anybody else was doing any kind of powder coating. They, they did that back in 2002. Notice these two, these two grippers. They went out, went out to grab these two very heavy goals. This is that year, there were three goals on the field. And it was just a rectangular field with three goals. Those goals were movable goals. If you got a goal into a certain zone, and then you got another goal, if you put a soccer ball into the goal, you got, you got more points. Each goal weighed 180 pounds. This robot probably had a, a weight limit of about what we have now, 120 pounds. So they would go out, they would ride on the two goals, they would raise those two goals up, they had a two seat shifter, they shifted it in low, and then they would crawl around a little bit. So it was about five teams that year that had two seat shifters. 
shifters. I was on one of them, Team 45. They were one, and that, that, the two-speed shifter that we developed on 45 ended up becoming the AM shifter, which was Andy Mark's first product. But the key with this robot that I liked was <coughs> their ability to lift the two goals entirely off the ground, shift to low gear, and get all that normal force down to push wherever they wanted to go on the field. It was pretty amazing. You'll see a video of them later, because they play against a team that was one of my other favorites. Mechanum wheels, mechanum wheels, whatever we want to call them, we can owe thanks to three, Team 357 that introduced those to first. Some mentors on their team were, were I think they were working at Air Tracks out of New Jersey, and they made a forklift. And if you look, if, if any you guys see the Star Trek movies, there's forklifts with these wheels on them in those Star Trek movies that are Mechanum Drive forklifts. And I was actually, I was shopping for forklifts about a year ago, and you could find one of these things used for about $15,000. I almost bought it, but I decided that would be a more of an emotional buy than the right kind of buy. But anyway, these kind of wheels were before um, anybody had them in first, so they took this technology to first. And I tell you, I was down to FTC looking today, and almost every robot on the FTC field has, has Mechanum wheels on them, whether they're ours or Nexus or Hangzhou's or, whoever, or Vex's or whoever's, they're, they're these wheels. So this is a great impact of mobility into the first world. Team 330, this is my, this is my talk about keeping it simple. Team 330 had a wonderful robot in 2005. They had a single articulated arm. This is their shoulder, and this is their, their gripper, was essentially just a, a finger at the bottom of their PVC arm. This is the year we built these catchers as a, a playing object, and you would get points by putting your, the catcher on the triangle. And I'm comparing the team that I was on, 45, with 330, because they actually beat us in the semifinals of our divi division. Now, our robot did really well the prior year. We almost made it to Einstein, but one ball away from Einstein. We had a, we had a, a turret, we had a, a, a lifting system, we had a, a shoulder, we had a gripper, and we had a wrist. Who are the robot drivers and operators in this room? Raise your hand. Robot drivers and operators. So if, if the build team gave you a robot with five pairs of freedom on that arm, how, how hard do you think it is to operate that arm? Pretty easy or pretty hard? Pretty hard, unless you put tons of controls and sensors in and automate it, which we have plenty of time for that, right? Well, which one is easier? Which one is easier to operate? This one or that one? This one, the beach bot. They, they beat us on the field because their operator had an e a lot easier job just to do this, and ours was, I think the kid had to hold his tongue in the right place and <laughs> do the, uh, it was, I felt sorry for him, but yeah, we, we gave him a robot that was really hard to control. Now this was the first year of three versus three, and you can see the beach bots are right here, right there, right there. This is hot team with a, with a triple lifter, and this, this, this group ended up winning the world championships. This is auto mode in 2005. Moving in auto mode in 2005 was a success. No one got the vision tetra on the thing, no, not one team got it on, on the middle goal, that was the auto mode task in, during a competition season. I think someone did it at a New Jersey off season event. But anyway, auto mode has come a long way. As you can see, these guys are right here. They were super fast. They were really elegant and simple on how they placed the Tetra. Did you, did you see that? There was a student that comes out and places the Tetra on the gripper. That was, that was somewhat safe. Um, but anyway, they, they had no bumpers back then. Notice the sides. Look at the sides of the robot. The sides are wedges. So if you try to push them from the side, you would flip over. That was kind of interesting. But they're, they're really good at just picking and placing these Tetras. This doesn't look that hard compared to what we're doing now. But they were doing this without a kit chassis, without a lot of the custom off the, or the um, commercial off the shelf parts that we now know and love. All right, let's keep going. Got to watch my time here. Oops. The team I was on, I think my favorite robot that I enjoyed building was um, our 1999 robot, 
called TKO. And this was the first robot that we had that actually had a shifting transmission. We had a, we had a Bosch drill motor and a Bosch gearbox with a little lever arm that we would use a servo to switch the lever arm from one position to the next. And that would, that would indicate high gear or low gear. We would use high gear to get to this puck in the middle of one of the fields. We'd, be lo we'd shift the low gear and pile on top of the puck. This year's game was a square field and um, first did this thing that threw everybody for a loop at kickoff. From 92 to 98, all of, all of the games were um, like, they were either one, one versus one versus one, or it was just one versus one in the finals. So there were no alliances. In 99, they said, hey, you're going to work together. You're going to go out and you're going to match together when you have alliances. We said, no way. That's not fair. Our team is dependent on our team's performance, not dependent on somebody else's performance. We're driven. However, it was genius. The year prior was my first year on the team. And you, so when I was on the team in the pits, I had to watch what the kids said to other people who would come by. Hey, what did Johnny Pitts say to that kid in Florida? marketing thing, this kick list and all that stuff was new. So that was a, 99 was a huge year. Now, what we did that year, um, that was the year after we won the world champs in 98. So we were kind of saying, what the heck, let's just build a fun robot. We built a metal track drive. We, it was later, in later years, this type of track, track drive was deemed illegal. We actually used metal conduit. We cut it into two inch lengths, cut it in half, shaved it down on, on a disc sander, and we bolted it to um, roller chain. It couldn't be attachment chain because that was illegal at the time. And we would get on top of this puck and we'd push all the other teams off the puck. It was really kind of harsh and this type of robot play would be totally illegal now, but you'll see in, the, in this video how the action was and it was a lot different than what we see now. So this is at Epcot in Florida. That kid now is a fireman in Kokomo. There's Woody introducing the matches as he used to always introduce the matches. And um, we, you tried to get on the puck, you tried to hold your own on the puck. If someone else got on the puck, you really wanted to push them off. So we get pushed off, there we go. And then we get back up. That's me in the hat, that was a long time ago. And <laughs> yeah, so I was, uh, I was trying to be the boxing trainer. This was the boxer and I was the trainer at the hat. So we, we pushed. 157 off the puck, and I think 157 went on Chief Delphi later on, and didn't, they said they didn't like that very much. So, yeah, but it was not illegal. It was rough, but it was fun. It was, yeah, it was kind of BattleBots. Okay. Team 190 has always they're kind of notorious for making robots that are really outside the box. They make unique robots that play the game in a unique way. They, this year, th they had a 10 foot tall bar going across the middle of the center goal. And they would, if you pull yourself up on that bar, you get a lot of points. Now, this game was played by collecting the purple balls. You would collect the balls and then shove the balls into the Alliance station. And your student was the only person that could put the purple balls into those uh, vertical goals. The robot couldn't put them in there, but the student could shoot them in there. Okay. Then you would put a ball on top, and that would multiply all your scores in the in the um, the score in that goal. They had this one had a CBT drive chain, and they had a telescoping arm, and it was just it was probably my, my, it was my favorite robot from 190. They could score and they could score while they're hanging on that bar. They could score the two times the multiplier ball while they're hanging. And this match video was taken from an off-season event. Once it came out, it was kind of legendary of how they played um, this match. This is autonomous mode. And you'll see they get some defense here, and they do some interesting things to get through their defense. Autonomous mode just ended right here. They're going to try to get on the bar right away. So here comes somebody to get in their way. I think this might be 121. I forget. But again, this kind of contact would not be legal at all. 
mean, that's assault in most states right there, I think. But <laughs> that was pretty cool. So that's one of my favorite moves and one of my favorite robots in first. So <laughs> I think they got posterized. OK, so let's keep going. I think sitting in first, at first place in, in New Hampshire is Team 146 robot from 1996. I don't have any videos of it. I heard it was really good. I, the reason why I like this robot, it was really one of the first artistically elegant robots that was also functional in first. It was extremely well polished. It was, it was, it was a, a piece of very high craftsmanship, craftsmanship, and the students and the adults on the team were very we're very proud of how it looked. And also, it's, from what I heard, it scored a perfect score on almost every round. So if you go to first place in Manchester, you'll see this robot. There's, a little, there's like a little wall of robots that are there. The Penguineers were an awesome team for many years, and they had one of the best robots in 2012. They had a really good sw swerve drive system. They had a, a vision tracking shooter system. It was very accurate. They had really efficient floor pickup of the little foam balls for shooting, and they had an effective, effective balancer at the end of the game. <coughs> so before we went to Worlds that, that, that year, these guys put out a video of one of their practice, practice runs, and they showed us who were competing against them how they could score 30 points at the end of the game, and or at the end of the match. And this was just a, a short video of them scoring those points at the end of the game. This wasn't an actual match, but we were, they showed this like on the week before we all go to St. Louis and the rest of us went, oh crap, we gotta play against that. You can see how they, they will drive over the ball with their swerve drive and they'll pick it up in the interior of their robot really easily. And you could only hold three balls at a time. And then they would, they would address themselves on the, the border of that platform there and they would just shoot these layups and it was, it looks pretty simple, but it was, wasn't the easiest thing to do. But, the, the, but the, the speed of them picking up the ball, the effectiveness, the effectiveness of getting the ball through their system <coughs> up into their shooter was not trivial. That was 30 points. I think it was 30 points. I don't know. I said 27, but I think it was 30. Anyway, it was one of the best ball shooters I've seen for that time of first, of the FRC. Team 131, uh, I don't have a picture of the robot, but they had a really simple design in 2000. <coughs> I remember talking to Dave and Nancy Kelso, who are the teachers on this team, and I, I was on a team, we were at, at Disney World, I ran into the, the Team 131, I said, how you doing? And they said, we're great. And I said, how many kids are here? We're 17 kids. And how many mentors do you have? Oh, it's, it's just Nancy and me. Nancy and me are 17 kids, and this is our robot. And they had a robot that probably should have won the world championship. They didn't really have any engineering mentors on their team. Um, and they beat seven, 47's best robot, which was Chief Delphi, which was the robot that everybody was kind of gunning for that year. So this is, I'm going to have to skip forward through into this match. Um, this woman here helps run first in Michigan right now. So she's a character. Um, there's Tim Baird. So this is, this is 126, and then that's 131 right there, the chaos. And, okay, so the, the, the yellow ball is one point. The, blue, the black ball is five points. And the key elegant thing I loved about 131's robot was the, their ability to take, to control a black ball, put it into a goal, or pull it out of a goal. This was the first year of the, the size of the field that we now know of the FRC field. All the robots will go down to the other end of the field to get, get these balls. There's Chief Delphi. There's Gale Force 126 right next to him. They're, they're getting the balls and they're going to put them in the they're going to put them in the, the goal. There's a red goal and a blue goal. And also a cool thing about this game is you can de-score your opponent's points. So 47 puts the ball in there from the left. And here comes 131 right here. They're scoring the black ball. And then they're going to try to get out a black ball out of the red goal. And I think they're going to do it here.
so that effective little design of descoring the black ball <laughs> was kind of troubling to everybody else who was against them, but that was very effective. And we're going to come back to this video, because I have another robot in that video that I like better. But we'll, like I said, it's a, I only have so much time here. So let's talk about impactful. This is during the, during the mid-2000s, if there is a ball game and you wanted to learn on an FRC team how to pick up a ball into your robot, you went nowhere else but to look at this team and see how they did it. This was the Grasshoppers, Team 95 in 2002. They, the, the, the game, this was the same game with those 180-pound balls. And you put a soccer ball in the goal. And so it was, it was a five, it was a soccer ball. Because some of you guys play soccer as, as a 10-year-old, I remember the ball that you would kick. So these things aren't light. It's a, it's a real soccer ball, kind of heavy. They only gave us, I think, two sims in the kit and a couple of seat motors and maybe a van door motor. We didn't have so he, He's asking about where are these designs coming from and what's the role of the mentor and the student. I think to answer your first part of that question, most of these designs were coming from adults, probably, on, on these teams. Adults le leading the design process. I'm not saying that adults are doing all the planning or all the design of activities and ball games, but I think there's a lot of adults designing these things. <coughs> Those two examples of 131 and 47 were two really good examples. I, I knew the 131 students really well. I, I, I still talk to one of them. Michael Carter, who's the MC, MC up at Northeast, um, the New England first on the MCs is ball. He was the human player on 131 that year. Anybody from New England? Uh, you guys, I'm a Houston fan, sorry. Um, so anyway, I'll give you my opinion about this. My opinion, this is an inspiration story. So the floor team is inspired by students building robots and running these projects and, and, and not just having other engineers. That's good for your team. And if, if your team is a bunch of engineers building a robot, and showing their kids those kids how how it's built and building a wonderful robot. Those teams on those teams, in my opinion, are being inspired. And it, it's not a science fair project. It's not an education program. It's an inspiration program. That's my opinion. I know that opinion is not shared by everybody. There's some teams that are very proud to be student designed, student built, and some teams that are that have somebody doesn't even think about building a lot of their own parts for their robot or design one. That doesn't happen as much as it used to, honestly, because those machine shops can't afford it anymore. They don't have that luxury. But I think for these designs, to answer that first question, most of those were made by probably engineering leaders and the students were with them on that path. I know the team that I was on, that's how we ran the team. We would, we engineers would design and the kids were right with them. And, and we were doing CAD together, doing that stuff. Good question. Do you have a, yeah. I tell you, it's not very competitive in FRC, and people joke about it. I think the mechanic will. I, I think that, as far as inspiring people to think differently on how something moves, I think the mechanic wheel is something that makes you think differently on how, how a robot or a car or, a, or any kind of propulsion, uh, any kind of transport device can move around and move. And it's, it's something, it blew my mind when I saw it. And now, I, I learned about that when I was, let's see, about 35. How long have you known about Mechanimal? This is your first year. Okay, so what are you, 14? You got 21 years on me. You got 20 years on me. You're 20 years ahead of me of just knowing about holonomic drivetrain being driven by Mechanimal. I think that's cool. So I think that, I think there's a lot of control system stuff that's, that's going on that's pretty amazing to me, LIDAR. Um, uh, sonar systems, vision systems, but I think I'm a mechanical guy. I'm more of a touchy feely. I can hold it in my. I, I like that. Yes.
my goal when we started Andy Mark is you could have a bake sale that could turn into a shift your gearbox. That's that's it. And, and you knew how to use it, but you didn't know you didn't know exactly how to design it, and you didn't know exactly how to build it. But then you would make it better. If you figured out how that worked, you can make it better. You can make a PTO, or you can make a lifter. Or anyway, a any other questions? One more? All right. Thank you. Thanks for listening.